Maria's had a wonderful dream and she's going to share it with us, so thank you. This was Saturday, a fortnight ago, and I just had an eye operation and I was really blurred. And after the operation, the, the next day I could really see well. And I think this was like another sign. Um, okay, so I woke up on Saturday the 14th um, praying and the dream was, the scene in one location was this church. It was a Sunday morning gathering and it was the usual, you know, morning um, congregation here. And Pastor Chris was at the front over there um, where he normally stands when somebody brings a word. <laughs> That's your plan. Um, just in case. <laughs> so the dream seemed to be in black and white, and, um, but it had very strong contrasting imagery. Um, I'm going to read because I don't want to go off at tangents, which I tend to do. Um, so I don't recall much colour except that there was exceptional, beautiful golden light emanating, and there was also complete stillness and silence in the room. I could see everything simultaneously, but at the same time, the Lord singled out elements. So at the front, just over there, there stood an elevated simple box with steps leading up to it. And it was situated the right side in front of the first row of chairs. It looked like a courtroom box, but then I realized that it was a pulpit. And Ram, who's sitting at the back, who was baptized recently, we all know, was standing in this pulpit and he was declaring truths about Jesus Christ and the gospel, about salvation, Holy Spirit, new life, power. And it was really anointed and he was flowing. Um, the, the Holy Spirit, I believe that that represented the Holy Spirit, which empowered Ram to, emboldened him to speak and, and pray about the gospel and about Jesus. So in the congregation, as it is the same as today, um, I couldn't actually see any faces, um, but I knew that we all kind of belonged to Vita but also some belong to antifreeze. And the only face I could see clearly was Danny. As you know, Danny's been saved recently. Um, and he was separated out from the others and he was really lit up with such a brightness and a glow. Um, it could just only be supernatural. And that light, emanated from Danny. It was so bright and luminous and radiant. It just shone out of his face and his whole body and everything else in contrast seemed quite dull actually. Um, and I was in the congregation too and I felt a very strong anointing in the room. Then I saw myself move forward um, sorry, and I stood very close to Ram, who continued in his declarations and witnessing that went on and on. And I was facing the stage, so Ram was facing the stage, facing north, I would call it. And then I prophesied and I said, behold, I am doing a new thing. The former things are passing away and I am making everything new. It was so powerful. It came out of the very core of my being and I, I could hear his voice sort of vibrating through me. But it wasn't me. And it was very weighty and I could feel his presence. And it came from a very deep place in the Holy Spirit. I continued in that deep Holy Spirit place, but I continued into prayer. 
and I was praying about the identity, our new identity in Christ, letting go of the old, being made righteous, wearing the cloak of righteousness, coming into a new season, taking authority and knowing who we are in Christ. And it felt really anointed. And again, it wasn't me. I then saw a snake just about here. And it was also facing the front, not facing the people. It was not evil. I knew straight away that it was a wise serpent. And the snake was slightly moving, um, just very slowly wriggling on the spot. And it was kind of laboring, trying to remove its top layer of skin. It wasn't a whole skin layer, which is normally how snakes shed, but it looked old and dry and messy, this top layer. But there were big holes and it, lots of crusty sort of edges. I could see really clearly through and between the large gaps of the skin because it was slightly, the skin was slightly elevated and it was very thin, almost like floating and separating out from the under layer of, of skin. I could see really clearly, mainly because the new skin underneath was just gleaming and radiant and golden and glistening. And there was a beautiful patterned oily skin that shone out and lit up the whole room. The old skin seemed to disappear in its kind of fragility and it was like a thin like veil. And then I woke up, I woke up praying out loud. <laughs> I continued. When I researched on the snake, um, it sheds it, sheds its skin where, with when there's water and humidity around. It needs water, it needs humidity, because that helps to lubricate the new skin. Um, it separates the old from the new, and it happens from the inside out, because the lymph glands release a liquid uh, for between the layers, the two layers of skin. So it rubs itself to make an opening near its head usually, and then it sheds its skin in one go normally. And in the dream, the skin was tattered, not whole, but it needs to be an environment of humidity. And when the snake hasn't had enough water to drink or bathe in, it doesn't shed its skin well, and it doesn't produce enough secretion from the lymph glands. So it can be dry and break up. But um, in the next season of um, shedding, then all that will be shed at the same time. So this to me speaks of needing the water of the word and soaking in the word of God. And God is working from the inside out through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I feel the snake signifies a renewal, a rebirth, a transforming process of being revived and restored. And as we surrender, the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. And facing this way, I felt, when I looked up, Bible scholars believe that the north is the place of celestial dwelling. And it's pointing to the sky, and according to the scholars, it signifies eternal and permanent of, of Jesus and Father God. And then the scriptures, <coughs> excuse me, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Revelation 21, 5. And he was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. Isaiah 43, 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So amazing. And behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents 
and innocent as doves. Um, Ephesians 4, to put off your old self which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and, and put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I love that. And my God, Psalm 80, my God turns my darkness into light. The Lord is my light and salvation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's 2 Corinthians. And it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The Holy Spirit was elevated in the dream, and I love the way Chris was standing back, allowing the Holy Spirit to be kind of in charge. And um, that's probably enough. Thank yeah. <laughs> There's a new day coming for the church in this country and we've, we've had many prophetic words and the UK church per se, I think Christians are hungry for a new day. And those of us that are longer in the tooth have seen um, some great starts in the church. And when I look back 30 or 40 years, I thought, you know, so many of the people who were living through these moves um, closer to my age have all gone. They'll all be with the Lord now. And we're, we're desirous of this new thing. And the Holy Spirit has to be elevated. The Holy Spirit has to lead. The Holy Spirit has to be the boss. And if he's going to work through the likes of you and me, then you and me have to die to self. And the old paths and the old ways are the true ways and the best ways. And with that, I think, is going to come more transformational leadership. People who are pressing in to saying, I want to be Christ-like. I want to be patient. I want to be loving. I want to be kind. I want to be self-controlled. And this idea of leadership, in inverted commas, that's barely mentioned in the New Testament, will move from a kind of a, a lording it over people, a kind of a, a leadership of the world, to a Christ-like servant leadership that we so desperately need um, in our country right now. So it's a great dream, and it's, it's one of many, and, but it's another reminder to us, um, because we, we're all Christians. We're like the, the Israelites going out into the desert. You know, you get out of Egypt, you see the Red Sea parted, and before you know it, you're moaning at God again because you, you don't like the food he's providing. We're all very similar to that. Patience is hard. Patience is, is a hard thing to wait on the Lord. Uh, if you've never tried waiting on the Lord, just, you know, you're suddenly looking at your watch and, you know, where's my phone? Or where you, you, It's hard to wait on the Lord for us, but we're to wait on him. We're to wait for him to act. And, and I think that in many ways is part of the season, at least, that we're all in right now. Um, it's a season that started. It's a, a season where more and more Christians now are cognizant of what I'm saying, and we're all very hopeful. So um, I'm going to continue the talk from Galatians with takeaways. You know, I, I don't just want to expound this book without it impacting our hearts and our lives. Paul wrote this um, as a pastor, of course, as an apostle, to bring correction. And when I read Paul's letters to the churches, they seem a million miles away from the sort of status quo, let's just sweep stuff under the carpet and keep the church happy, you know, kind of church that we are. Um, but Paul wasn't like that. Paul addressed things that needed correction. And he did it because he loved people and because he loved God. And if you love Jesus, you'll put him first. And if you love Jesus, you'll say, I'm not sure I like this, Lord, but when it comes between honoring and obeying you or listening to people and honoring and obeying them, I'm going to honor and obey you, and I'm going to speak the truth. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's what Paul did. And I think he was always very conscious of who he was preaching to and who he was under. 
as you and I should be, that God is watching us, he's listening to us, and so on. So we looked at the first half. We're going to start with verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is credentializing slightly. Paul is saying to them, you know who I am, and we'll see later on as we go through Galatians, the, the, these people, it's like you foolish Galatians, it's like you stupid Galatians, what, do you, what are you up to? Haven't you heard the gospel? Hasn't it changed your life? Hasn't Jesus been revealed to you? So why would you suddenly move away to a gospel that's no gospel at all? Why would you suddenly, from drinking the water of life, stop drinking it and, and somehow drink from some other well? We should all have takeaways, really, as Christians, and keep going back to the lover of our souls. Keep going back to our Savior. Keep drawing back to him. We so often turn away... Um, or we, we just kind of drift along for a while and then we, we have to turn back again to Jesus. And he said, what, what, what he's preaching to them, of course, he received it not even from the apostles. He's not saying, look, my revelation is greater than theirs or it's greater than yours. He's just telling them the truth. Paul is specifically chosen for this time in the church. Chosen from his mother's womb, but nevertheless chosen. And he's given a revelation of the gospel to this really brilliant Jew who would have known the Old Testament scriptures backwards, forwards, every which way. And so suddenly, I think, in a moment in Damascus, it all becomes clear to him. I don't know how many prophecies of Jesus there are in the Old Testament, but I, I think it amounts to hundreds if you really go into lots and lots of detail. Paul would have been consciously aware of these prophetic words about being born in Bethlehem and dying on the cross for our sins, just in that moment, you see. And so the question here is, I didn't receive it. He received it from Jesus Christ. So one of the things about the Bible, and often you hear sound bites from people, well, it was written afterwards, and how do you know it's true? How do you know what's written is what they said, and this sort of thing. Um, and those questions can be answered, really, if people want to know the answers. But we have literally thousands and thousands of extant documents um, that have come from the first few centuries of this Galatians. Extant means we, we have them written down. And we know that the people who copied the originals copied very, very accurately. And how do we know that? Because we found a first century copy of Isaiah, the whole copy of Isaiah, the, the, the earliest copy before the one found in the, um, the caves of Qumran um, by an Arab boy, I think, in the 1940s, was something like 900 AD, 900 years later. But the one they found was from the time of Jesus. It's exactly the same. See, the scribes who copied, copied exactly. It was a tremendous amount of pride in their work. And remember this as well, at the time that Paul is writing, there were more hostile witnesses to Christianity than there were favorable witnesses to Christianity. If this wasn't true, if these words from Paul are not true, the hostile witnesses would have come out everywhere. Said, you're making it up, Paul. Nothing's happened in your life. Of course, there's just the human reasoning that here's the Apostle Paul with a great deal of credibility in the Jewish community. He's been trained under one of the, the foundational leader, leaders, Gamaliel, of his day. Paul was uh, persecuting Christians, so again, that's a notch up, isn't it? He's doing his job well. He was zealous after Christians. Um, even as you, you see this same kind of zealousness, I think the closest zealousness is looking at some of these people from Hamas that are willing to kill themselves and die and persecute and murder and kill innocent Christians. This kind of zealousness was in Paul. It's not a righteousness. It's not a Christian zealousness. It's, a, it's an evil zealousness, actually. 
Um, but Paul had that. That was the kind of zealousness that he, that he had to. Um, thirdly, you know, with, with the, the biblical things like this, um, just some of the archaeological discoveries, even recently, um, here's one for you, but um, let's find that. Yeah, here it is, the, 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 the Tal Den Stele. You know, for years, and, and this was me growing up as a Christian in the 80s and 90s, People said there was no reference to King David. The Bible can't be true. This, this whole Davidic dynasty um, in the Bible isn't true. And then in uh, the late 90s, they found an inscription called Bet David, the House of David, the first non-biblical reference to King David. And they found it in Dan, the northern part of Israel, for the first time. See, the Bible always comes out trumps. And God always seems to leave enough evidence for its truth, and it's found. This is in the 90s, this archaeological discovery was found. It's in the, one of the museums, the main museum of Israel. You can go, go and find it. Um, another one, Pontius Pilate. Of course, he's mentioned by Tacitus and, and so on. But in 1961, the Pilate stone was discovered in Caesarea Maritima. The inscription bears Pilate's name and title, providing, again, physical evidence for the Bible. Pontius Pilate was a real man. He really was a proconsul. He really existed. Um, now, we believe in Christ by faith. But it's not an existential faith. Our faith and belief in Jesus, our faith and belief in what the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatians uh, 2,000 years ago, it, it's not like, a, you know, I bought a lottery ticket, I hope I win. Just some kind of nonsense faith. It's a real faith. We can really, really trust what the Bible is saying. We can believe it because of all of these various different things. Many of you will know they found the Pool of Bethesda, which again you can find. If you go to Israel, you can find the Pool of Bethesda exactly as it's mentioned in the Bible because the Bible describes these, these sort of colonnades and they discovered it and they found it. Or you can look it up on YouTube and they'll give you a documentary for these things. The Bible's true. Uh, in a world where subjective truth is what people want, People don't want to hear the truth. If they wanted to discover the truth, they'd find it easy enough. Jesus doesn't hide himself either. If you want to find Jesus, as Danny discovered, you just put your hand up, say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my life. How hard is that? People don't want the truth. Romans says people suppress the truth by their wickedness. In other words... The natural state of human beings is to suppress the truth of God all they can because they just don't want to know. They don't want truth. They don't want life. They don't want him. Until the Holy Spirit does something or until people are so desperate that they'll call out to him again. I don't know what's going on in our country, but what a mess. I mean, that's not, you don't need to be a prophet, do you? What a mess our country is in. Law and orders, of course, as you would expect, is um, getting worse. But when things are messy like that, coupled with scientific discoveries and molecular biology, cosmology, and so on, that, that, that actually we, we now know that Darwin isn't true. We, we haven't come from nothing. You don't get species and changing species from nothing. Why? Because the molecular biologists are showing it now. They're showing the, the complexity of DNA. Well, if you add all these things into the mix, it's going to make people think again. And so as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we need to be able to give people an, ex, um, an answer. If people say the Bible's not true, you should have an answer for that. You should be able to say, well, actually, this is why I believe the Bible. I don't believe in your Jesus. I, I don't believe he ever existed. You, you, you should be able to get some kind of apologetic answer for that. Because our faith doesn't rest on some sort of existential, um, ethereal cloud out there. It rests on a book that was written by human beings over 1,600 years that holds together and is factually accurate. The Bible is, has been torn apart from people, but all the time it comes back. It's factually accurate. 
in the 60s with the, the kind of the beginnings of all the nonsense we're seeing in our culture now, the Bible was just dismissed. It was myth. It wasn't true. And, and they would, you know, those that were more erudite would argue that this isn't true and this isn't true. Like there's no King David. But then in the 90s, they find proof for him. They find that the, the um, Bethesda is true. It's all true. Everything we're reading about today, this is true. This can't be bent. It's true. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing when you're a Christian. It's a wonderful thing. I became a Christian through a power encounter, just like, again, referencing you again. That's how I became a Christian. I was powerfully converted at 19. I mean, I was just filled with the glory of God. I mean, it changed my life. And I thought, man, I, that, that's all we've got to do. You know, just zap everyone. <laughs> and I still believe that too. We need revival. But once people are zapped, like Danny has been zapped by the glory of God, then you need to know, what is it? Who's zapped me? What's he done in my life? Where is he from? Tell me about it. We've got to be able to, to show that. And here it all is in the book. You cannot argue with this book. This book is absolutely... 100% uh, true. Well, I can say that, and it logically hangs together. And if these sort of progressive liberals that use all these grandiose words don't want to agree with it, then let them. Let them disagree all they want. Because the Bible comes back up, um, showing it all to be true. Um, I'd also say it's a living word. You've got to read the Bible to prove this. I, I go for a walk on a Monday with a Buddhist friend, someone, one of the fathers from uh, Anna's school. I was going, I'll, I'll walk with him. And I, I, in doing that, I discover more and more about Buddhism. And what is obvious to me about Buddhism is there's no understanding of sin, none. So what it's done to him, it's like a self-help. It's got him away from drinking and drugs and it stabilized his life. But it's given him no conscious awareness that he's a sinner. It's like one big self-help. That's all it's done. Um, when you read the Bible, and Derek Prince said that because he began to read the Bible in the 1940s. A typical, I mean, he was, he was very cerebral, Derek Prince. Very, very disciplined and very academic. And he decided to read the Bible I have a feeling he read it in the Hebrew and Greek. But as he moved from Genesis, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, as he went through the, the opening books of the Bible, he said, for the first time in my life, I became aware that I was reading something that was describing me and I didn't like what, the way I looked at myself anymore. He became conscious of his own sin. He became conscious that this holiness of God was revealing something in his life that he didn't like. You see, once you know him, once you know Jesus, you're not going to be a happy sinner anymore. If you don't know Jesus, you can, you can happily sin. Maybe you feel a bit guilty here or there. Once you know him, once you know him, you always want to go back. And I'm looking to those moments of being all of us going back to our first love and knowing what it is to be utterly accepted and loved by him. So, um, they're the kind of reasons that when we read Galatians that we might believe. So let's move on. I didn't receive it from any man. And uh, Paul's having to say this. Paul is unlike 99% of leaders in the body of Christ. I think number one is, these are people that Paul's converted himself. When I look out at you, yeah, one or two of you have been converted because I preached the gospel to you and many over years. Paul converted the whole church. They're all his converts. Do you know how special they are to Paul? They're not objects of his ministry. You know, I, when uh, Maria was describing the snake and coming into the new things and the wisdom that the, the snake is, that we'll become a wise church. He loved his converts. He loved them. He prayed for them. He said one time, who doesn't sin and I don't inwardly burn? 
He even felt the pain that God feels when they would sin. He loved them. And so he's not content to think, well, we've got a great church. I mean, they're coming to church. They're worshipping. Let's leave them alone. I mean, if after all, I mean, I mean this, is, this is a Western way of thinking. If I confront them, they might leave. I might reduce the numbers. I might have less people coming to church. Paul doesn't think like that, does he? Why doesn't he think like that? Because he's under Jesus. When he's preaching, when he's correcting, he's not fearful of human beings. He's not even thinking about what they think. He's thinking, what does my saviour, Jesus Christ, think of what I'm saying? What does he think? When I meet him on that day, have I done and said and spoken what I should have said and spoken? That's the Apostle Paul. My gosh, we need people like this. Pray it in me. Pray it for me. Because that's who he was. That's what he did. He said, you've heard of my previous way of life. How intensely I persecuted the church of God. How I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. Among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. You know, Paul was converted, wasn't, I, wasn't he? And we... We know what Paul was like before. I mean, you can't really describe Paul as a bully. I, I suppose it would be like in Nazi Germany, the Gestapo knocking on your door. He put fear into people. When the angel of the Lord came to Ananias and said to Ananias, I want you to, to go to Saul, I want you to lay hands on him, and um, he's to receive the Holy Spirit and his blindness will go and so on. Ananias was like, Lord, I know this man. I know what he's like. He persecutes. And the angel was gentle with him and said, yes, but he's, my, he's the Lord's chosen instrument. And he's going to suffer greatly for, for following in the name of Jesus. So people were afraid of him. You'd avoid him. I mean, he, he will kill you. This is who he was before. We, we've seen one or two of these leaders of Hamas. One moment that they, they, they have no, you know, the, the worst, it, it's like, it's like, I suppose, I don't like the word possession, but it's like being d just demonic possession. Everything evil from the enemy is, is, is taught to these people from an early age, and they think it's God. They think it's God to murder people, to rape people. They think that the Lord is calling them to blow themselves up. They think they're going to end up with 73 virgins. It's evil. It's all evil. And yet God can take someone who's been brought up with all that. And he can move them from all that darkness. And in a moment, he can move them to light when they hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to pray for that. We need to pray for that every which way for the kind of evil that, that the enemy tries to put and perpetrate in the lives of human beings. So here's Stephen, and you can read Stephen's speech. But in Acts 7.57, he says, They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, which again is indicative of Saul's if you, if you like, his ecclesiastical standing in the Jewish community. Saul was a rabbi. Saul knew the scriptures. Saul, Saul was a, a pharisaical Jew. They laid their clothes at his feet that this was a legitimate killing. Stephen deserves to die. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, now listen to this, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's Christianity. While people are murdering you unjustly, of course, people are killing you. He's looking up at the right hand, he sees heaven, he sees Jesus. Then he sees the people who are killing him, and he says, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. He's praying. Can you imagine a few years later when the Apostle Paul gets his head chopped off? Stephen! 
Stephen! They hold and hug this man who'd caused his death on earth. Can you imagine, Stephen? You wrote what? You've done what? If Stephen doesn't know from the cloud of witnesses, who knows what they know? Absolute, complete and total reconciliation. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's the heart of Jesus. And I know there's right from wrong. What these men are doing to Stephen is wrong. It's evil. But Jesus has a way of reconciling people and making people who are Jew and Gentile, Greek and Roman, slave and free, God has a way of reconciling them, making them one. And while they're here on earth, they worship together in his church. That's the church of Jesus. Every tribe and every nation and every color come together and worship because we're reconciled and made one through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then what does Paul do? You'd think, well, all right, Saul's converted. Get me my Facebook. Get me my Instagram. Get me on TikTok. I've had an amazing conversion. Jesus has spoken to me. Let's get the message out there. Let's tell everyone. Let's lift me up as high as possible. No. Paul's quiet for about 11 years. He says this, But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, he called me by his grace and pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult human, any human being. I didn't go to Jerusalem to see who those were apostles. I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. Paul went, went somewhere quiet. And I think Paul needed somewhere quiet. Paul needed to, you know, after what he'd done, after all his zealousness, now he knows Christ, he went somewhere quiet. Waited on God, in other words. Probably 14 years before he was sent out with Barnabas and John Mark on his missionary journeys. See, there's something there as a takeaway, isn't there? Um, I, I watched it with one of the famous um, singers. It was Kardashian's husband, whose name escapes me. And it seemed for a while that he'd met Christ with his um, particular um, bipolar disorder. And unbelievably, they were putting him on stages in front of tens of thousands of Christians. And I thought, what nonsense. He's just met Christ. He needs quiet. He needs peace. He needs to be integrated into the church. He doesn't need to be put in front of people. He's not your latest, you know, look at this. Follow Jesus because Jesus has converted him. We don't need this kind of Christianity. We don't need it. We want God's kind of Christianity, the holy kind, um, if you will. So he goes into Arabia for all of these years. And of course, he says it's God's grace that he's saved. We'll, we'll close now. He said, after three years, he went to see Peter, stayed with him for 15 days. I can only imagine. I'd love to be a fly on the wall there. Um, and, of course, he saw James, the brother of Jesus. Then he went to Syria, Cilicia. He was unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. They praise God because of him. Listen, in the first century... God decided this man, this brilliant man, this genius of a man, this man, this, this Jew, would write the New Testament letters and he would go to the Gentiles to convert them. You don't think God wants to grow his church and God will, will final takeaway today, but God decides who he chooses and when and everything else. You think Britain's, Brighton's a bit too tough for Jesus? A little bit too difficult, too many people have different worldviews, and no. Not when God decides to do something. When God decides it, he'll do it. In the meantime, we just get on with it. We live godly lives, holy lives, loving lives, servant-filled lives. We pray for people wherever we can. God be the glory, and God gets the outcome. Sometimes you pray for someone, it's amazing. Sometimes you lay hands on someone and you feel nothing. You do it anyway. Sometimes you witness and people come. Sometimes you witness and they don't. 
we do it anyway. Sometimes you're kind to people and they throw it back in your face. Sometimes you're kind to people and it changes their heart. We do it anyway. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the truth of the gospel of Jesus. We can, we can rest our lives, our children's lives, all our hope for our future on this book, on these words. Amen. So let's stand. Let's pray for a moment or two.